Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. Hello and welcome to Capes on the Couch for Comics Get Counseling. I'm Anthony Sitko. And I'm Dr. Issues. This is issue number 123, Nebula as chosen by Ruby. Uh, a fantastic choice. A very interesting character. I would say there's definitely a, a difference between the film version and the comics version. We're going to get into that uh, momentarily. Uh, but a couple of quick things. Uh, first off, this episode, although not being recorded on my birthday, is being released on my birthday. So happy birthday to me. 39 Yay. years around the planet. And uh, I'm still here. So for better or worse, uh, another uh, reminder to back the uh, Erica Schultz Deadliest Bouquet Kickstarter. Uh, as of this recording, it's like two over two thirds supported. I have backed it myself. So looking forward to that. We'll have the links in the show notes. And most importantly, before we get into the the actual episode itself, the most important bit of housekeeping. Something that uh, Doc and I have been discussing as of late is whether or not, or something I guess we've talked about since the start of the show is whether or not we would ever take on advertisers. And I've listened to you know, dozens of different podcasts, as I know Doc has, and I've often been curious about the gross disparity between the message of advertising and the message of the show that there's there's often just this wide berth of shows just saying we'll take on any advertiser who's willing to hawk their products and by the way i'm not taking anything off of any of those podcasters everybody has to do what they have to do that's their shows and they are perfectly well within their rights to do whatever it is they want but you know doc and i as much as we like to joke about how we don't take ourselves incredibly seriously on this show and we don't Selling something and taking on advertising has always been one of those things where we didn't want to do it just for the money. It has to be something that we believe in or that we personally use, but most importantly, one that meshes with the message of the show. And that is betterment, self help, mental health, all of those things. And so. We are very proud to announce that we have partnered with BetterHelp. And so just as a little way of the ad read, this is, the, like I said, the first time we're, we're doing something like this. Uh, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp will assess your individual needs and match you with a licensed professional therapist. You can begin communicating within 48 hours. It isn't a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. BetterHelp has a network of over 15,000 counselors with a broad range of expertise. You can log in and message your counselor anytime and get timely and thoughtful responses. You can also schedule regular video or phone sessions. No waiting room required. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if you feel you don't have a good connection. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit betterhelp.com slash capes, that's better H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Special offer for Capes on the Couch fans, get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash capes. So uh, as I said, that's something that, you know, we were very cautious about and we wanted to make sure that we maintain the integrity of the show with the advertisers that we do have and BetterHelp, obviously. Telehealth has taken off no small part due to the COVID-19 crisis, but it just in general, the notion of being able to talk to a licensed counselor and get help when, when you want, wherever you are, you don't have to worry about physical distance. That's something that we definitely believe in. And as we say all the time on the show, you know, help is out there. You are not alone and help is out there. And BetterHelp is, is absolutely uh, one of those companies that is, that is uh, doing just that. Exactly. Anthony introduced this to me and I said, oh, we need to jump on it. It's, it's very clear that they are, you know, in line with the message that we've wanted to send to people for a long, long time. And 
that's what we'll continue to do. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, you know, have them as one of the people in terms of advertising. This is on a case by case basis. So in other words, we are not about to just start taking anybody and everything that comes our way. We're still going to make sure that we do what's best for the show and what's best for you. So, you know, thank you for everyone that listens. Thank you for everyone that supports us. Uh, and we'll continue to present the same high quality content uh, in addition to giving people opportunities to find ways for them getting the help that they need, no matter what it is and where it is. Absolutely. Having said all of that, and now, now that we've gotten that out of the way, uh, let's dive right into the character of the week, Nebula, created by Roger Stern and John Bushima in Avengers 257, July 1985. Uh, she hijacked Thanos' ship while he was sort of in this between life and death state, and she claimed to be his granddaughter, but she ended up being defeated by the Avengers. So when Thanos returned, he burned her body using the Infinity Gems and kept her barely alive. She was still technically alive, but she was essentially a husk of her former self. And so when Thanos in the Infinity Gauntlet story, once he possessed the full power of the gems and went sort of ethereal, he left his body behind and Gamora took the gauntlet off of his physical body and then used it to restore herself. And then she used the gauntlet. And long story short, she was defeated by the Avengers and in prison, you can go check out the Infinity Gauntlet storyline for that. And we did the episode on Thanos uh, very early on. That was that was definitely year one. And so while imprisoned, she underwent surgery by Dr. Mandibus to restore her body and mind, although it did leave her as a cyborg. And uh, th so that's sort of the appearance that uh, MCU fans are more familiar with, as opposed to the earlier version where she actually had hair. Uh, then she served as a member of Gamora's Graces and she battled Ronan, the accuser, during the Annihilation event. And then she was hired by uh, Kindun to track down Gamora for retribution for Thanos' crimes to him and his planet. But she was again defeated by the Avengers. Then she was hired by Thanos' son, Thane, to help him kill his father. Uh, but when she realized that he had lied to her about stealing a phoenix egg, she killed him. But when she killed him, that hatched the egg, which rebirthed Thane and gave him Phoenix powers. And then when Thanos and others banded together to defeat Thane, Nebula was left behind in the God Quarry. This is the Thanos story by Jeff Lemire. And uh, so then she escapes the quarry and she obtains uh, this dangerous weapon, which she used to attack several planets, including Earth. And this time she was defeated by the Asgardians of the galaxy, Thor and or I, I don't remember if Thor was was involved, but there were Asgardians and also Guardians of the Galaxy, Asgardians of the Galaxy, hence the, the name. So she's mostly an Avengers and Guardians villain, but she is definitely tied to Thanos in all of her comic stories. You know, most of the, the comic stories have her involved with Thanos in one way or another, which, as I said, leads to the movie version where she's Thanos' adopted daughter. So th there is quite a bit of difference there between the, the connection, because in the comics, as I said, she says she's Thanos' granddaughter, but there's nothing actually there, which is one of the reasons why Thanos does what he does to her. So jumping into the issues then, the first one is the trauma that she suffers as a result of her treatment by Thanos. Matt as we were getting ready, said it's very much a, I have no mouth and I must scream because she is captive within her own body and isn't really in charge of herself. She can't really do much. She's just basically there as Thanos's plaything to yeah. basically say, look, look at what I can do. She, I think at one point he refers to her as his greatest creation because she's not alive, but not dead. She's very much in that middle zone. And so that is very clearly a traumatic experience. And I would argue a close analog to that would be anyone perhaps who is, you know, fully paralyzed, you know, or undergoing any sort of neurodegenerative disorder where they have full control of their thoughts but they can't really do much. You know, I would, I think, you know, a Stephen Hawking type, you know, where he's very much a brilliant person, but his physical body is, is limited. So that's a horrible experience for anybody to undergo comics or otherwise. 
Yeah, absolutely. So one of the most basic things that we learn as infants is the idea that we can influence the things around us, both physically and I'm not talking telepathy or anything, but just the idea that the things that your brain creates can have influence outside of your own mind. That is incredibly powerful. And so when you learn that you can speak and that someone hears you and then when they speak back to you, your brain processes it and now you can create a dialogue, that is so germane to just about all of existence, not even just on a human level. Animals do this in their own way, and we're still trying to understand how certain animals do it because sometimes it's in ways that we don't understand. So the idea that that's taken away, sometimes it could be even just the basic senses. If you're deaf, but no one taught you sign language, my goodness, or you don't know how to read. There are so many things. You can have bits and pieces here and there of what we end up taking for granted as adults. And, and yet ask anyone that's had those things, not just never developed, but heaven forbid, they had it and taken away in a way I think that's worse, where now you've, you've lost a part of the essence of life itself, of what it is that we do. I, I hesitate to, to say that I understand because in a way there's no way I could understand. I take it for granted that I'm able to have all of this. The fact that we're doing a live stream and then later on it's going to be a podcast. This is the type of stuff that if you are not able to communicate on the most basic needs, can you imagine the idea of being hungry, not being able to tell someone you're hungry, having the sensation just build and build to the point of near starvation and just hoping that someone understands that because you have that basic need, they're going to feed you every day and therefore you have a feeding tube. Or the idea that you unfortunately have the bodily functions that we all have, but you can't clean yourself and you have to rely on someone else recognizing at some point that you're going to need cleansing and changing if it's a diaper or if you have other things. You've had a colostomy done, but you also are in a coma. Obviously, if you're in a coma, you're not going to be able to say anything about it anyway, and therefore your consciousness is different. But let's say it's not even that. Let's say that you also have difficulty in terms of actually expressing yourself, not necessarily because your vocal cords aren't working or things like that, but you've had a traumatic brain injury and therefore you have aphasia and your communication skills are not what they used to be. And so just the, the simple points that you used to enjoy, you can't do anymore. All of these things. I can't imagine the amount of emotional frustration and, and the grief the idea of loss, if once again, if you've had that before, and we've done a few episodes recently about those things, so you can reference those. I'm not going to get into all of that. But just the intensity of all these things happening, the, the juxtaposition of what must be the most intense experience for a person with regards to emotion without any of the physical sequelae of it, the physical consequences or the things that even if you don't have language, you could still understand. Everyone knows what happens when someone screams or when someone cries or all of that. And not even having it, I think Matt hit it perfectly. So with Nebula, when someone has stripped away all of those things, and yet by some very nebulous, pardon the pun, definition, you're considered alive. And then to experience that for an indefinite period of time, my goodness, I... I I, I'm not sure there is a right or wrong way to respond to that. Heaven forbid someone recovers. I, I hope that it's the type of recovery where the person is able to regain the things they lost. But even if they haven't, that there would be some sort of connection with others around them so that it wouldn't nearly be as bad. Uh, because it's it's really sad. And I've had that experience in the hospital, of having the John Doe or Jane Doe that nobody can identify and there's nobody else around them either to to help with that process. And yet it's now the responsibility of the state and the facility or, or whatever to just make sure that person stays alive because no one knows what their wishes are. That's one of the most horrifying notions, at least for me, 
the idea of being trapped in my own body. And Matt on the live stream brings up uh, Metallica's one inspired by the anti-war novel and film Johnny Got His Gun uh, is another uh, fantastic artistic expression of that idea. That's absolutely the case. In fact, Metallica bought the rights to the film adaptation for use in the music video for one. You know, the, the voiceover of the guy, he's in his head, he's trapped in his hospital bed and he wants somebody to kill him because that's the only way he's going to escape. And so the, the, the trope of, you know, and I must scream. I was just while you were talking, I was just on the TV tropes page for it and just reading some of the examples of it and just, ugh, no, 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 thank you. Right. I mean, well, that even then, that's, that's based on the science fiction story. Uh, which honestly, you make sure you have a, a really cast iron constitution for that. Cause if you read that and I have, uh, it's, it's gruesome. Yeah. No, 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 thank you. And now I'm picturing like old Captain America. No, I don't think I will. So, uh, so issue number two then also related to the Thanos thing is she lies about the connection to Thanos. And it's a combination of fear and respect because Thanos obviously is widely known throughout the Marvel universe as a real bad dude. And so she hijacks the sanctuary to his mothership. Uh, so when we first meet her, she has this crew that basically, they're kind of scared of her because, I mean, she, by the way, she's a badass in her own right, but she has this aura about her and this, you, oh, that's Thanos' granddaughter. Ooh. And even in the movies, that's, that's alluded to that, you know, she is the daughter of Thanos. And so that connection carries with it a certain um, power that she willingly manipulates and uses for her own good under the assumption she's not going to get called out on it, which, of course, she does see point number one. But when, when you and I were writing this, you said you're definitely aware of, of situations where people have lied like this for, I mean, the, the reasons are obvious. It's for the power and for the, the benefits. But, you know, if you could just, I guess, delve into that a little bit more. So... The first part is verbatim, like practical. It actually has happened. The other one is much more metaphorical, so I'll get into both. Uh, first, the practical side. This can be as simple as someone, especially when people are younger, teenagers especially, uh, you, you just kind of, even if you're not directly lying about something, you're, you're just embellishing just enough that you're trying to get your peer set to, to connect with you. Like, yes, I was in the same room as such and such person. It could be a, I'm not even talking to someone like super famous. I'm saying it could just be a popular person in your school. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I was at that thing. And then magically you have somehow in this story morphed it into you're really tight with this person. And it's like a game of telephone. Yeah, yeah. And, and mind you, in the era of social media, it's much less likely that you're going to be able to get away with an outright lie. But you can skirt the edges still. And some people will put pictures of when they were with this person or even took a picture with someone. But if that's the only encounter you ever had and that other person doesn't even remember it, but they're not direct, <laughs> as, as Anthony on the live stream does that classic point with the person, the idea that that other person, let's say, is not friends with you or, or not linked with you or whatever, so they don't even know your existence in that way. So... That can be perpetuated and it just goes on and on and on. And if you're trying to build yourself up, it doesn't necessarily have to be for the direct gain, like in Nebula's case. It can just be this idea that like, hey, did you see this thing that I did or, or I experienced or whatever? And everyone's like, oh, yeah, that's great. Oh, da, 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 da. And, and yet at some point, someone innocuously, I'm not even saying like purposely, just says like, oh, yeah, so what are they like? And then some people just, feel like they need to go on with it because at this point you're already in too deep and and in that case they actually start developing developing these false stories i've actually like seen this happen it's 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 fascinating it's worse with people at least because i work in an inpatient psych hospital some people get delusional about these things and that's really sad to see but you know just the idea though that you have to create this falsehood of of part of your life as we've said it's not just going it's going beyond the idea that you're living 
or, or, or having people live through the highlights of your life, it's like you now have to add on the layer of Photoshop to it. And, and it's just not necessary. And, and it creates more problems than people realize in the moment. So that's the just really basic take at face value, practical side, very literal. The other one is the metaphorical. And, and we've talked about this many times about what's the image that you've created for yourself? How do you view yourself? And I'll go to one of my references in, in terms of boxing or MMA or whatever, where someone gets the moniker, you know, baddest man or baddest woman on the planet. There's a reason why that gets built up. It's because it starts to feed on itself and create a momentum that allows for continued success. And inherently, I'm not going to say there's anything wrong with that until at some point there's some level of confrontation where things don't go 100% the way they should. Because at least from what I've seen anecdotally, and I'm not just talking about sports, I'm, I'm just saying in general, if you build up such a facade, such an aura of invincibility in one area of your life to the point that people think you're bulletproof, then the second that even like there's one tiny piercing of that veil, then it can lead to significant negative consequences. The emotions behind that balloon deflating, or rather, honestly, more like popping and, and just completely falling apart, uh, it can be devastating in terms of the depression, the, the anxiety of, of, well, now I have to get it back, except there's no such thing as recreating, once again, to go back to the analogy, recreating an undefeated streak. You can only be infinity and O just one time. <laughs> so... Once that happens, you have to recreate yourself and you have to do it in a way that you know is going to be much longer lasting than what you originally figured on. So that can be any sphere of life. If you end up going down that road, the thing that I've said to patients is just recognize that you're now the king. And, and I know the old saying from the wires, you know, you come at the king, you best not miss. In this case, it's more like, you know, everyone's coming at the king. and someone's going to hit. So be aware of that. And, and I, I'm doing that as a cautionary thing, because if all you're doing in your own mind is, is inflating your own ego to the point that you feel you're untouchable, boy, oh boy, it's going to happen someday. And, and heaven forbid, it's sometime before your deathbed, because there's going to be major consequences to your own psyche. Don't lie. That's basically, <laughs> I mean, listen, we all lie. I mean, we kind of have to it at some point, but to your thing, you're, we're talking the big lies, you know, little exaggeration, little white woods here or there. You, you can get away with it. the big ones. No, no, don't play. Honesty. It may hurt and it's, it's not always going to be pleasant, but in the long run, it's much easier to live. It's just vastly less stressful than trying to constantly have to keep track of all of what lie you told whom. No, no. Preach. Just don't play the game. Just don't even... The only winning move is not to play. So Matt brought up Tyson and Holyfield, by the way, as Amy. to your earlier point. Well, I mean, I'll go before that. Tyson and Douglas, my goodness. Buster put it on him in that fight. Okay, anyway, sorry. <laughs> well, there's a whole number of... Re but yeah, we're not... This isn't a boxing podcast. We're not getting into that. So the last thing is uh, the surgery by Dr. Mandibus left her scarred physically and mentally. Now, Dr. Mandibus is a character who literally has only appeared in those three stories, those three individual issues of the Silver Surfer book that tell the story of her reconstruction, so to speak. But in this effort to rebuild herself, to to get back to the version that she was, she became a cyborg. And it clearly had an impact on her, as I say, not just not just physically and mentally. And it is not an easy thing to undergo something like that just on the physical level and to have the self image of yourself as one way. And then to wake up you know, from surgery and looking like something else. We see that with, with the face transplants, the, the people that have undergone that they, I'm certain, require some level of counseling to address the fact that you have this idea in your head that when you look in a mirror, you're going to see the face you've come to expect. 
to now see something different is not an easy thing. Yeah, I I was fascinated by the juxtaposition of what doctors go through with these circumstances versus what patients go through. So what I'm about to say is incredibly general and by definition does not match every situation. So please don't take that part from what I'm about to say. Surgeons at times can be very brief to the point, factual about what they're doing, and their personalities are just as varied as anyone else's. But the stereotype is that sometimes they're a little gruff. Uh, that's not true of all surgeons. And I've met plenty of great ones that, that have a different personality. And yet, if you ask some patients, they'll say, oh, I prefer someone like that. Let's just get down to business. <laughs> they just want whatever surgery has to happen done and, and that's it. But those are voluntary. If you know that you're going to have surgery and you have the right to consent to that surgery and, and have the risks and benefits explained to you in an appropriate manner and agree and are aware of possible complications and things happen, you'll talk with the surgeon, the surgeon will talk to you, and that'll be that. Uh, that is, I'll say overwhelmingly, the majority of situations. For trauma surgeons, though, for plastic surgeons that have to deal with crisis situations and, and reconstruction, for orthopedic surgeons that are setting some really bad injuries that a person didn't expect and may not even be aware of just how extensive they're going to be, all those things, imagine that same situation with those similar types of conversations, but only after the fact. You didn't really get the opportunity to have them beforehand because people were trying to save your life. Well, then. You didn't get the opportunity then to have that same process. And everything has been taken away from you in terms of that control, but now you have all of the consequences of it. So from that standpoint, the first person that you're having that conversation with is someone who's not exactly trying to do the type of in-depth analysis emotionally that you would expect. That's not in their wheelhouse. That's not a knock on surgeons. Let me make that clear once again. It's just that you know that that's not what they are meant to do. They are meant to save your life. They're meant to give you the information and they're meant to be a professional in your corner that's going to help you. And they do that very well. But all of the other consequences that potentially are going to happen for the rest of your life, the first time someone looks at you and doesn't recognize you, as you mentioned with facial reconstruction, or the first time someone notices that you're not walking the way you used to, all those little things, the first time you get up out of bed and you notice that the routine that you once had, you may or may not be able to do the way that you thought. All those, those moments, it's, it's not always these grand, sweeping, dramatic things. It can just be those little things that used to be a comfort that can no longer be. Th those types of I like to call them micro traumas, the, the small emotional things that we try to sweep under the rug, but yet build and build and build. And if you don't address them, really lead to severe emotional consequences. But because you never address them and never let anybody know about it, it comes across as, oh, well, it seemed like everything was going smoothly. And then all of a sudden, wow, it was just like they were a different person. Like, well, not really. Um, I, I mean, it can happen that way, but not always. And all of these variations, if if you don't have the right people in your corner or you push away the people that were in your corner, because that happens too, uh, then that road becomes much more difficult. And with Nebula, it was actually fascinating where if you if you look back at the specific issues, she did have someone on her side just saying, like, how was she? And, and that person grabs uh, Dr. Mandibus and Dr. Mandibus puts out his scalpel finger or whatever and, and like just says she's fine and he gets let go. But I thought that was very telling because the point is when, when trauma happens, people often just want immediate answers and they want to have this sense of control. And sometimes the professional, whether they mean to or not, want to also maintain their own control and let them know that they're on your side. And yet, because they are defensive about what they've done, because they know that they've wanted to help, they may come across as aloof. They may come across as, as uh, inconsiderate. And, and it just creates more tension for everyone involved. So I'm trying to put this together to point out that there are so many sides to these 
situations that in the moment, we're not really considering that. And yet at some point, we need to put all of that aside and focus on the person that ultimately had the experience. And as long as we do that, we're going to end up with better outcomes overall. So with someone like Nebula, my goodness, it's not just enough to say like, well, you survived. It's I'm glad that we're giving you a position to thrive. And in a way, when you think about all the things, evil or not, <laughs> that she's accomplished, in a way, she she has gone further than you would have expected, given all of the <laughs> scenarios that she's had to endure. So I'm going to give some credit to that, <laughs> I guess, but not ignoring the fact that, I mean, if any of us went through half or a quarter or 1% of what she went through, I don't know how we would have endured. Or if we would have endured at all. Going back to your your discussion of micro traumas, which I thought was uh, very fascinating and just a, an idea that I never heard a term put to it. But, and it's funny, like I said, this episode's coming out on my, my 39th birthday. The simple idea of just realizing you're getting older, you know, and that when you used to be able to do certain things, you know, you and I, uh, again, we're recording this on a Sunday night, you and I went to a wedding last night. Just the idea of, hey, you know, let's go out after the the party and let's go and keep drinking and da 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 da. If we were in our 20s, like say when you got married, that was fine and we could recover much more easily. We are in our late 30s now. We are pushing 40. We cannot do that any longer. We have to hydrate. We have to take these little things into consideration because it's that that idea that I don't bounce back the way I once did. And some people acknowledge that and they make the adjustments as needed. Others are still under the delusion that they can do it. And I, we talked about that not that long ago in another episode of the idea of, of exercising as hard as you once did and, you know, without giving your, your body that break. So that's something that I would say is as a micro trauma and just that, that acknowledgement of I'm getting older and I have to do things a little differently because my body is paying the price for uh, things that I used to be able to do. Well uh, said. Yeah. As Matt says, I don't mean to brag, but last night I was in bed by 930. <laughs> oh, man. And, and you want to know what's even worse? The first thought I had was, wow, I'm jealous. Yeah, not for nothing. Yesterday, when when we were recording this, it was it was great. I was a groomsman in the wedding. He's he's a good friend of mine. He's he's a buddy. I love him. But the night before, I slept like garbage. So the entire day of the wedding, as a groomsman, I'm there. I had to be at the you know I had to be at the hotel early. We had to take photos. Then I had to be at the church. Then I'd stand. Then we had to take more photos. And da 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 da. I I was dead on my feet by seven p.m. And I love to dance. I love to party. I love all those things. And my, my poor wife, God bless her, sitting next to me while we're sitting at the table and they're playing music. And she goes, don't you want to get up and dance? I said, I, I can't. <laughs> like, like physically, I just don't have it in me. I was exhausted. I was so dead. Even today, I'm still dragging ass. So, and yeah, I, I took a nap just before we... uh recorded and your text actually is what woke me up <laughs> <laughs> so to your point matt i'm in bed most nights by 9 30 the fact that it's you know almost 10 o'clock now is is a late night for me so yes you get it absolutely yeah another, another micro trauma uh so we're going to take a break we're going to uh, plug a couple shows and we come back we'll get into treatment stay tuned welcome to our channel the nerd crusade I'm Beastie Boy. I'm Table. I'm Red. It is I, Shino Brando. We discuss topics from across the nerdiverse, from video games, anime, comics, and more. And if you want to chat with us, you can find us on Twitter at Crusade Nerd, on Instagram at Nerd Crusade, on Twitch 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time every single week. You can find us wherever podcasts are found by searching Nerd Crusade. And that's to be continued. Podcast fans, 
I'm Rachel, host of We're All Mad Here, a new podcast about the history of mental health. Do you love history? Do you love creepy stories of abandoned hospitals? How about questionable medical procedures? We're covering it all. Not only will we sneak around in old asylums, we'll talk about the patients that stayed there and what their lives were like. We're covering disorders, cures, and living life with mental illness. So come join us on We're All Mad here at allmadpod.com because the history of mental illness is insane. Hi, I'm Saladin Ahmed, and this is Capes on the Couch. And we're back. So treatment in universe for Nebula. So I'm going to reference something from our world, but I'm going to apply it much differently to the Marvel Universe. There is a term of psychosurgery, and there are very few diagnoses that call for it. Uh, OCD, severe depression, uh, you can do something called nerve stimulation to alleviate the symptoms. But it's not done by a psychiatrist. It's done by a neurosurgeon. Don't worry. The proper people are doing the physical part of it. But the idea that you can involve direct physical intervention and help with the psychological and emotional aspects of someone's disease is a great thing. In the case of someone like Nebula, who clearly has had the physical things happen in addition to all of the emotional uh, results of all of it, (laughs) I think I need someone who, first of all, has demonstrated that they've endured certain things, but I'm not sure we need to get as physically involved as we may have to do some sort of, ooh, some interesting things within her mind and someone who's actually shown they can delve into someone's mind, understand it and come out on the other end without doing significant harm. Although it still was pretty interesting. And we've discussed her doing this to a character in one of our previous episodes. I'm talking about Emma Frost. I want to get her involved. I want the idea of, of being able to be in there and seeing what the constellation of nebulous thoughts are and what the pattern is like to actually see it because nebula has decided that she's going to go down such a path we get introduced to her through deceit of lying about the whole connection with thanos which ironically leads to a connection with thanos and then the idea of well if that's the way things are going to go then she's going to have All of these other things happen in terms of the trauma and she's never going to quite fit in with anybody and all all of that stuff. I can't start with the construct of what she's doing if I don't know where it all began in in terms of just untangling this web. So I really want to get in there and start untangling these streams of consciousness. I, I don't even know what it looks like, but I'd be fascinated to do it. And having someone like that that has that experience I think would be pretty cool. And if it all goes wrong and Nebula gets super pissed, then I'll just hide behind Emma Frost's body and be okay. All right. That's an interesting take on it. Emma has a lot of versatility for many of these characters, I think. Uh, Many of these particular treatment type sessions. But I also know that you don't want to repeat yourself often and say, okay, we're just going to bring back Emma Frost and she's going to psychically do da 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 and then everything is fine so but but using her both for her mental prowess as well as her physical abilities is uh that's a smart smart choice so out of universe i would say maybe somebody who has undergone reconstructive surgery due to you know say maybe a burn victim will bring it back there yeah i mean um, it could be a it could be assault it could be what i'm saying i guess i'll, I'll cut to the chase like it can be the traumas of both. It could be the physical trauma. It could be the emotional trauma, the mental trauma, everything involving all of these things because it gets so complicated. You know, that's, that's yeah. at least. Yeah. 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 So. So go ahead. All right. First, making sure the person is physically stable, uh, which can't be overlooked in terms of what's going on with them uh, and, and recognizing what their wishes are, because. Sometimes that gets overlooked. We, we worry so much about are we doing enough to save the person's life, uh, as you mentioned with Metallica's one. Uh, we, we don't acknowledge what their wishes are in the first place as to how far we should go. And if we know that ahead of time, get an advanced directive, people. 
then we won't overshoot the mark. That's the first thing. The second thing is once we've established that and the person has survived whatever procedures that were necessary to save their life, and we now say this is where they are, we try and meet them where they are, uh, we have to establish or reestablish communication. Uh, I've referenced this in other episodes. Make sure that the person actually understands what you're saying, if they are aphasic or if they've lost certain senses, recognizing it and incorporating adaptive and assistive technologies. Do you simply need certain gestures? Do you raise your eyes to say yes and down for no? Do you nod properly? Do you know other forms of communication and language? Can you still write? Do you need a message board, a sounding board, or, uh, things that a person could physically use? Or is it similar to the type of sophisticated adaptive technology that Stephen Hawking used? So uh, there's so many variations to that, establishing that. Then from there, don't assume a person has a certain set of emotional responses. Ask them once you've established what communication style is necessary. Do not assume that a person that has been attacked is automatically angry. Do not assume that a person that was involved in a horrific car accident where people died is automatically super sad. There's so much variation to it that if you take it for granted, the person is going to shut you down because they're going to think you're completely missing the mark. And if there was a situation where, and and I want to be careful how I say this because I'm not placing blame. I'm simply saying that, heaven forbid, it's someone that was involved in something where they had an, an active role in it. Heaven forbid it's someone who was a drunk driver and they suffered consequences in addition to whatever happened. Maybe they're the only person that was actually physically uh, injured, but they did a lot of damage because their car flipped numerous times or whatever. So now it's not a matter of saying, oh, you're a drunk driver, you're a horrible person. Like, no, it, it, it's just simply now we have to move forward with whatever it is that's that's gone on. Uh, there are some very sophisticated techniques, and I know I, I don't automatically get into a lot of things with medications, but these are the circumstances often that you will see not just psychiatrists, but you will see people in palliative care, which are people that are supposed to help alleviate the pain and suffering that someone is going through and make things more tolerable. We may use medications that are outside of their typical categories because we know how the nervous system and how our brains respond to certain things and get a little more off the beaten path. And it scares people sometimes because they think they're being guinea pigs, which is the exact opposite. It's that we know based on other patients' experiences and what patients have told us have actually shown benefit, as well as doing cognitive testing to show uh, that there is some benefit to what we do. In addition to that, (laughs) we also want to make sure if people have others in their corner, we want to make sure that they Uh, have access to the type of counseling that may be necessary dealing with a new life for themselves as well as the person that was originally involved in the circumstance. So there's a lot going into this that if we miss any of these steps, it's going to be more difficult for everyone involved. And, And just focusing on that and once again, being the proper, I'm going to use it colloquially, listening ear, because maybe it's not an ear. Maybe it's your eyes to look at what they're typing. Maybe it's making sure you watch their face, whether it's a grimace or a smile. All of those things that we, as I've said so frequently this episode, kind of take for granted and yet really need to hone those minute. If there's such a thing as micro trauma, then there must be a thing as micro healing. Recognizing that when a person says something that you think is a positive statement, smiling at them. Making sure that when they say something that sounds sad, that they notice that you actually have a response to it and frown. All those little things that lead us to have a greater connection with one another in the world at large can really make a difference because they add up as long as you do them consistently. I love that. If there if there is micro traumas, there must be micro healing. Wow. Because it's funny because when you were when you were first discussing the micro traumas, I was like, well, that absolutely makes sense. But it never occurred to me that there must be a counterpoint to that. Positive. So, right. So so to directly link it, it's like, hey man, it's really fun. It's it's fun growing old with you. You know? I'm glad that I have someone 
like you to to experience some of the things and know that I'm not the only one. Well, I think that's, and uh, well, for, I appreciate that, but it's it's common, I think, for folks that have friends around their own age, you know, because obviously, if you're all friends from a certain grade, you're all you know, within a year of each other. And so you're all going to go through many of the same things uh, around the same time and experience them in roughly the same eras. So that's that's a helpful idea. Matt brings up the interesting question. Does that imply the existence of microtherapy? So that's a that's a great point. I, I had to be honest with you, I hadn't even gone that far to, to think like that. But um, I think a lot of my training really comes down to that. because. We know that words really do make a difference, not just medication. So I think the fact that as a professional, especially because there's a certain expectation, I think that that that's that's fair, that that's realistic. Uh, I don't take it for granted, for example, when someone asks me offhand, even in a conversation where I am not their quote unquote therapist. If they ask me a professional sounding question, I not only give try and give a professional sounding answer, but I make sure that I'm demonstrating even in a few seconds the fact that I consider it to be as important as anything else in the world because it is. And I've actually gotten feedback from people that sometimes say like, you know what, honestly, just, you know, you just you taking that time really helps like, oh, OK. And and and. My personality, I'll admit, I tend to brush that off because the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, how did I screw that up? And I, I, you know, I actually have professionals that I talk to about that just for that reason. Uh, But yeah, I, I, I love that idea. And, and I think over time, when you look at it, honestly, I, I, yes, there is a certain level of training I think is necessary to do this on a regular basis. But all of our conversations, all of our interactions with one another in this world really do come down to, are you helping? Are you hurting? Are you neutral? And even if 95% of conversations or any sort of interaction is neutral, that 5% really makes a difference. So I'll definitely give credence to what Matt's saying there. It truly does. And I think to your point regarding taking the time to acknowledge the people and and make them feel seen or heard. Uh, one of the masters of it in just a very subtle and understated way was Fred Rogers. And that's one of the re- many, many reasons why I canonize him as much as I do. Because anyone who ever had any interaction with Mr. Rogers for even the smallest amount of time said when you were speaking with him, it was as though he gave you his full, undivided attention, no matter what the situation was. He took the time to hear you and to focus on you. And that is that is very powerful. And 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 Tamara in our the live stream just said, I've definitely experienced micro healing and group therapy where just my emotions being noted moved me to tears. That is an incredibly powerful thing, particularly if it's if it's a foreign concept. You know, if being denied or being invalidated has happened to you numerous times over the years, to have somebody say, you seem very upset, would you like to talk about it? Even something as basic as that, which again, it is a a very legitimate and, and a very basic, simple question, but not everybody gets that. And so to have that, to experience that and to say, thank you for noticing can really, as as Tamara says, can really be incredibly powerful. Yeah, that's a that's amazing. And uh, just even Tamara saying that, I had a certain response in my heart. I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, wow, I wish that when patients experience that, I hope that they say that to either the person in the group or other people in the group, uh, or if it's one on one to the therapist, because believe it or not, a lot of therapists do wonder even while they're doing their job, was that helpful or did I do it like in a way that that helped the person? And and getting that direct feedback can be incredibly beneficial because it allows them to know they're on the right track. Um, it just yeah. when I was in, when I was in therapy, I made sure if my therapist was saying things that were helpful, 
I, I said, you're, you're hitting, you know, you're hitting the mark. You're, you're on point with that. And thank you for helping me to address, you know, all of that. You know, Janine adds uh, in the live stream, even someone validating the fact that you have the right to have those feelings. I mean, again, it all comes down to this, this very basic low level. And I think, unfortunately, so many people tend to gloss over that or they tend to, to take that away because it doesn't fit the narrative or the idea that they have in their mind. And, you know, that's something that as a parent, I'm always uh, trying to, to do with my son, that if he's upset about something, I'm not going to say, you know, if he falls down and scrapes his hands. Now, it may not be a serious injury. And I know, you know, five seconds later, he's going to, you know, move on from it. But I'm not going to tell him if he starts to get upset, oh, you're fine. Because he's going to get adjusted to having his thoughts and his feelings be invalidated. And so I never want him to feel, I never want him to question the validity of his feelings. I never want him to go, well, am I really okay? We do that as parents a lot. I, I say that, you know, just sort of generally speaking, that we do it with good intentions. I, I just want to be perfectly clear about that, that we don't want our children to feel traumatized. We don't want them to feel that everything is a big deal. But in so doing, you can go end up turning the other way that now they're constantly questioning, well, am I really feeling like this? You know, we see that unfortunately a lot with sexism in society that girls question if something they did triggered a response by a man that, you know, if they were if they were assaulted, you know, raped, what have you, you know, or even just accosted that did I do something to invite this? Like, no, no, you did not. That's you right. Absolutely that's absolutely did not. Yep, that's, that's abs- you're absolutely it's, correct. It's so deeply ingrained that they start questioning, did I do something to warrant this? And it's very real, you know, so we have to, if you can break that down on an individual, you know, micro level, you know, and Tamara references gaslighting, you know, that that's, that's exactly what that is. She says, insert dark joke about gaslighting. I mean, my, if you take it back to the, like the original movie, you know, in play, uh, my family says that all the time, you know, oh no, Paul, uh, you, you know, you are going crazy, you know, cause it was the, the Frenchman and, and the wife was Paula and so on and so forth. So we, we do make that little joke about it, but, but actual gaslighting is not a joke at all. But, it, but it all comes down to, again, validating that emotional response and to say it's perfectly okay to be upset about this. Now, how do you want to address that? And that's something that, again, my son is too. But I just say, you know, are you sad? You know, you seem sad. Are you angry? Like, just ask. Just simply asking him, what are you feeling right now? Are you this? You know, and let him, letting your children have those feelings because what if you let them authentically express it, they will then be better equipped to authentically address it later on. Now, I'm not expecting my two-year-old son to be able to adequately manage his emotions at any given point. But if I deny him the ability to express and address them now, he's never going to learn by the time he's older. You know, or or it's going to be that much harder for him to do so. I want to set him up for success as much as possible. And I think that's something that we need to do collectively as a society is allow people the ability to authentically feel their feelings and to say, okay, I'm acknowledging that what you're feeling is real. Now, how do you want to go about these things? And I think if if we can do that on mass, and when I say on mass, I mean, you know, individually sort of one-on-one bit by bit, it will spread and we can begin to collectively heal and collectively improve, you know, emotionally uh, as a society. And again, pie in the sky thinking, but if you just do those little things bit by bit by bit, it it will get better. Amen. So we got, we got into some heady stuff here, much more, much more, what's the, the word? I'm sorry. It's late and I'm, I'm draining, um, positive minded, uh, 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 Help me out here. You're sitting here looking at me. I'm, well, what do you, what, I, I'll be honest. I'm not optimistic. So, Jesus Christ. How would I? Okay. So, so, well, all right. I'm so we were just talking about, about, right. Blah, blah, blah. We're, we're talking, well, we're talking about communication and, and making sure that you're heard. So you saw the look on my face. I was confused. That's all. 
Okay, fair enough. This is much more optimistic than I had initially foreseen this topic going. But in any case, uh, we're going to put all this together and see what happens when we get Nebula on Dr. Issues' couch. Hello, Nebula. I'm Dr. Issues. Well, they're making me do this, so hello. I I apologize. I don't intend to make this painful for you. That's what all doctors say. Are you implying they don't mean it? I'm implying that they don't understand from this end of the transaction. Well, I'm not like the other doctors you've met before. My goal is partly based on what you want out of the deal. Partly? Well, since you're deemed a danger to society, I'll get the elephant in the room out of the way. I can't get you a release. I didn't expect as much. So what then? What's your idea of rehabilitation or manipulation? I understand your lack of trust based on prior encounters with those you disagree with, but how do we build that trust together? You didn't promise me anything I couldn't get for myself. That's a start, at least. Interesting that you should mention that. How much of your troubles have been based on lying? Everybody lies. Maybe, but there's volume and magnitude. Maybe is a lie, just as an example. A shallow one. And a prescriptive one for this conversation, yes, but... It's an example of trying to manipulate someone whom you think doesn't deserve a straight answer. So, I'll affirm what you're saying. Everyone lies, including me. There's volume and magnitude. Hmm. I think I have a better way to go with this. Good, because if you were going to question my lineage... Who do you trust with your most intimate details? Who gets the little white lies instead of the big, bold ones? Not you. Well, I appreciate the truth in that statement. Uh, Does that type of response evoke a different emotional reaction for you compared to your typical answers? My responses don't provoke emotion in me. Really? Because you bristled pretty badly when you thought I was going to get into a sensitive topic. You're trying to connect two different things. Very different things. I don't need a doctor giving me a history lesson on my own past, and I don't want anyone pretending they can try to connect things they don't need to know about. Closed book. Got it. How long are you going to remain on the shelf? Until I finally get things exactly the way that I want. And even then, you'd remain a closed book. Another random faceless person in control that can't connect with anyone. Yeah, that that actually sounds like a pretty joyless life. Just because you don't get an invitation to a party doesn't mean the party doesn't happen. You think other people ignore me? Defy me? No, they follow my lead. I'm not as unknown as you think. Just unknown to you and anyone else I choose. Then what are you doing stuck in such difficult circumstances? Struggling day to day to keep so many people at bay? (sighs) Look, I know you fought many a battle. You've had allies. Then things turned sour. You know, each time you've ended up with only yourself to rely on and you rebuild. And I really admire that, you know, but. That can make it difficult to trust anyone, let alone me. Where does it end? I mean, is it really that bad to save yourself the time and energy by having a, like a core group of people that you can fight in instead of, you know, just treating each conversation like a battle that you have to win? You don't live through what I've lived through by using lighthearted banter. You're polite. You're presenting yourself as kind. Weak, maybe, but that's a contradiction in your position, as you made it clear from the start. I have no assurance of anything from you, and yet you somehow expect me to go along with this? That's not realistic. Well, that's not your reality, but it is mine. We all have our own. The closer the two realities can be, the greater likelihood that the outcomes are compatible. So in my existence, if your assessment is accurate, that should be evidence of that. So it's up to you. Can you come to terms with the idea that some people in the universe can have good intentions and lie, and make mistakes, and tie emotions with their words without automatically wanting to make things worse for the other person? Perhaps. Perhaps not. I promise nothing. I only promise my effort and attention. I still promise nothing. Then we can both keep our word. Win-win. Only if I say so. Well, you didn't die, so that's a win. Yes. And she didn't completely shut you down, which is also a win. Yep. I wouldn't say you 
got through, but again, not in the slightest. I, <laughs> I'd say it was I say it was neutral, which and yeah, under the circumstances, I'll take it. Fair enough. So, uh, recommended reading for Nebula is the Infinity Gauntlet, as we said earlier that uh, she does play a large role in that, and then some of the the Roger Stern era Avengers stories that uh, that she has a large role in said at 257 and then in the, the 270s some of those eras uh that that era of, of storytelling she is largely an avengers villain i would say most of the avengers stories before the infinity gauntlet to get an idea of where she comes from before or that that lead to her disfigurement at the hands of thanos so uh, upcoming episodes are victor zaz and then rogue and then we're going to take a break for a few weeks because we have been doing this show uh, every week since January and it's the summertime and uh, Doc and I are just going to take just a couple of weeks off just to catch our breath and, uh, you know, decompress a little bit. And then we will come back to you probably sometime in July with, uh, with some new episodes and some new characters. We've got some good stuff and, uh, you know, we're definitely going to, going to enjoy Enjoy the time off, not that we don't enjoy bringing the show to you every week, but, uh, you know, just getting to, to take a little bit of a break. So we'll give you an opportunity to catch up on some shows you may have missed. So spending so much time listening to our melodious tones. Uh, <laughs> please, please. Uh, I, that was a joke. That was a joke, I, I swear. So as we said at the top of the show, uh, BetterHelp, uh, BetterHelp.com slash capes uh, for 10% off your first month. And uh, you can join up there and get speak with a licensed professional counselor at your leisure. And uh, all of our episodes are available on our website at capesonthecouch.com. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Capes on the Couch. And uh, we've got the, the Discord group that uh, you can join our fan community. We will also have a Facebook fan group as well. And uh, our Patreon if you want to subscribe and unlock additional content and early access, patreon.com slash capes on the couch. So that's all I've got, Doc, uh, before we head out. Anything you want to add? So I'm going to give a little bit of an education here. So a nebula can mean one of two things. A nebula can actually be a blind spot in your eye on the cornea, or it can be an actual form of gas and other substances in space. So Find someone that you can trust and let them in so that you can watch your own blind spots. In that way, you'll have the type of life that people will be able to look up in the sky and recognize that you are great. Wow. Okay. It was a pun, but with some knowledge behind it. We don't get that many of those uh, on the show. I would say we need more of them, but we don't always get those opportunities to, to come by. So... Thank you, Doc, and I uh, appreciate that. So for Doc Issues, I'm Anthony Sitko. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there.